Hello and welcome to WRUW-FM 91.1 Cleveland. You are listening to A Different Drum, where the more you love music, the more music you love. I'm your host, Matt Hook. Today I'm joined by acoustic guitarist Eric Skye. Thank you for joining me, Eric. Thanks for having me, Matt. Eric Skye is one of the finest acoustic guitarists in the country with a style that fuses bluegrass, jazz, and country together. His latest album, Blues and Ballads, was released earlier in October. The album, as the title suggests, is a collection of solo guitar versions of popular standards mixed with his own original songs. To introduce you to his music, here is Message to CJ.
That song you just heard was Mess- CJ by X Guy. So first off, who is CJ and what message were you trying to send him with that song? Uh, wouldn't you like to know? Um, oh, okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, CJ stands for Carlton Jackson, who, um, is a drummer here in the Portland area. Who's just someone I just greatly admire, just a phenomenal player. Um, for a while I had a kind of a working jazz trio in town, uh, although it's kind of been some time since I've done that. And so, um, Carlton was a integral part of that. He's also, you might be interested to know, um, a very loved uh, radio personality here in town. He has a Sunday night show called The Message on our jazz station here. And um, it's a great show. So uh, it's kind of a play on The Message. Um, and CJ is Carlton Jackson. Gotcha. And was he part of your slow moving dog trio? No, Carl and I started doing gigs after that. Uh, that's Bruce Robertson, who's my longtime. Um, engineer who's recorded most of my material playing the drums on that now carlton plays in town but um he's also like just the kind of the first call um you know guy when someone's coming to town i know he's played for bill bill frizzell and uh booker t and charlie hunter and people like that so why did you move away from the trio format um you know solo guitar has always been my main thing and i always come back to it um for a a lot of reasons although even when i was in a trio i was kind of playing you know similar approach you know still playing fingerstyle acoustic guitar um part of it's economic you know um i had a sort of a very occasional manager person in new york once referred to me as this comedian because i need one plane ticket one stool one glass of water and one lunch um it's just a much easier way for me to get around and do things too honestly that's a big part of it i'm guessing recording sessions are cheaper as well because you don't have to have as much yeah. Yeah. Although I, I will probably circle back to that because I, 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 it's occurring to me maybe for 2019 that I need to start playing in my own town a little bit more again. And I do I do miss playing with uh, other people in that in that way. So the please the form that's been around for basically forever. How do you keep it sounding fresh on this album? Yeah, great. Well, um, you know, I think one of the key elements of this this album i think is i sort of asked myself and i i sort of jokingly refer to it as my blues album although as you know there's some there's some ballads <laughs> hence the name and there's you know there's some other kinds of things but it's predominantly blues tunes and what they all have is they're all just slight twists on this sort of 12 bar chicago blues so for for example for you musicians out there um i know like my um like contemplation is a is a minor and it's in a waltz and a sixteen it's a sixteen bar blues. Um, there's you know nostalgia in Times Square is a twelve bar blues, but you know if you've ever looked at the chords to it, it's a very interesting little journey compared to like a three chord Chicago blues. Um, Blue Monk has an extra bar of the five chord. There's just each one has its own little thing going on in it that makes it different than a regular 12 bar blues. So that's something I'm always sort of drawn to. Um, but, you know, playing them instrumentally on solo guitar uh, finger style is is probably a little bit different than the typical sort of you know, accompanying someone uh, vocally in blues or the, you know, sort of taking a guitar solo on top of bass and drums kind of thing, you know. I guess you have a bit more room to move around. I also noticed that you have that Glenn Campbell song, which is called Lineman, on there. <laughs> yep. That's not a blues or a ballad. Why did you decide to include it? Yeah, that's a good, you know, It to me it is a ballad, you know, but if you're a jazz guy out there, I can hear you cringing, you know. I mean, it's it's not it's not from the Great American Songbook, but it, it's one of the most beautiful you know, songs ever written. And uh, it's just from a different era. And, um, you know, I guess I'm not really making it swing. So there's that argument. But it's just a song that I wanted to do. And, you know, we're so beyond the point that records have to fit into bins squarely anymore that this is just something that I play a lot in the last few years. So it's going to be a part of the, you know, the new album, basically. (laughs) Gotcha. I mean, I guess you could argue that it is a pop music standard now. It's been around for 
because yours that song was like 67 like it's been around for a uh, long time yeah oh yeah and i think from the around that same era i have um ode to billy joe by uh, bobby gentry on there and that's also um you know although that's one sort of been adapted in the sort of soul jazz world for many years now mm-hmm. um so it's just really you know which ones are sort of inside the <laughs> the standard repertoire I mean, there's plenty of pop tunes. Um, you could certainly argue someday my prince will come. Also, from this record, which is from the 1937 movie Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, um, you know, there's a movie soundtrack that's been because of Bill Evans' recording, sort of adopted into the uh, the Great American Songbook. So, I, mean, I guess that's how most of the Great American Songbook happened, right? It was like some like Charlie Parker or Miles Davis would take a movie soundtrack song, play it themselves, and then everyone else would try to copy it. Yeah, you nailed it. Exactly. So I know also for this album, this was funded through Indiegogo. Why did you decide to choose that approach? You know, I'd never done that before. And I have to say, it it was really great. Um, You know, making records is not an inexpensive thing to do. And so to, you know, really what it served for me is most people just bid on um, or they pledged to get a pre-release of the album, you know? So it's really like I pre-sold the record to my, my, my typical, I guess, base fan base or whatever. So, um, you know, it just really freed me up um, to take my time and mix and master and do things that I normally would sort of rush through. I mean, I've, I've always recorded most of what I've done just in one day. Um, and so I'm used to working that way. I, I Even if I had raised, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, I could never spend weeks in the studio. I just don't work that way. But it just allowed me a little bit more um, space to kind of move around in a little bit and experiment. So wait, this album was recorded in a single day of recording? Yeah, my last four albums were recorded that way. That's kind of how I operate. I just sort of, you know, I practice a whole bunch and then I just go in and just have a brain dump. Um, I, I find recording, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm of mixed mind. I mean, I love it, you know, but it's also a little bit stressful and I just want to just, yeah, <laughs> I just want to dump it all in one day. So I'd rather just practice in my kitchen and then, you know what I mean? Rather than go in and record one song and then go in and record another. And also, I think it adds to a kind of a continuity of the way it sounds and everything. I mean, it's I did change strings once about halfway through the session, but, you know, it's the same strings in the same room. It's, you know, I didn't get up much. So, yeah, I just basically recorded everything three times, which took about f- four hours um, and then we just kind of sat on it. And then later I, um, you know, separated the wheat from the chaff. And did you do most of the mixing and mastering yourself? No, I have, um, a team of, of, uh, people here, <laughs> basically my friend, uh, Bruce Robertson, who's, who's recorded, like I said, just about all my records, except for artifact, which I made in, in Los Angeles. Um, and then there's a, um, a studio here called sisterly silence. Um, uh, Corey, I can't remember Corey's last name. Um, and he's, he helped me with some of the editing, you know, kind of separating the wheat from the chaff part. Um, and then, um, a friend in Eugene mastered it to, um, to tape. Um, so we had an old half inch, uh, uh, or one inch tape machine and, um, yeah. That's, so you, it's like, a, so you recorded this in analog tape instead of just a pure digital this time I recorded to digital, but then we mastered. So the last step went to analog tape. Um, there have been other times when I have recorded to tape. I, I do like tape. I think it still adds like a little something, something, a little a little schmear at the end there, um, a little tape compression, I think. But um, actually recording to tape sometimes can be a pain in the neck um, just because – well, maybe it's just me because I'm cheap, but the last, I had my June Apple record, which is sort of, we'll call my bluegrass record, was recorded to tape, but I only rented one reel. So everything has to happen in, in real time. Um, so, you know, you record 33 minutes uh, with the music and then you wait 33 minutes while you load it onto Pro Tools and then you start over again. So a lot of stopping and starting. Um, but I do like to have tape somewhere in the process. And he just adds a nice sheen. Yeah, I mean, what I usually tell people, I mean, digital is still 
I guess, quote unquote, better in so many ways. Right. But it's like if you I mean, we all stared at Instagram all day, I guess. But, you know, we're used to seeing these digital images, which are just so high def that you can almost not even process them anymore. And that's what digital recording like is like. And and that's great. Right. But if you've ever just picked up like an old Life magazine, a uh, big analog <laughs> photo, you know, taken with a film camera in the 70s or something, it's like, oh, man, you know, there's just something, you know, it's just the, it's not pixelated. It's um, it's just kind of smeared in a way. <laughs> I don't know. It's, there's a little character to it that you don't get with like a pure, with like a perfect digital photo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know with like using Mike, for example, it's just like, you know, he's somebody who has this piece of gear, this like 80s tape machine, and he loves it. And and so, you know, I, I want him, that's that's his mojo, and that's what he adds to it. And I think any, you know, engineer that's been doing it for a long time, and they've got some old tube mic that they just love, and they have a great story with, you should, um, you know, let them use it. <laughs> you know, let them bring their thing into what you're doing. Um, I'm a big fan of collaboration. Uh, partly it's necessity. I'm just not smart enough to sit there and do all this in Pro Tools. And I don't want to also be the guy that captures it where I'm trying to sort of have a moment, you know? Mm -hmm. I just want to have, I just want to, you know, I just want to do my thing and be creative, you know? But still, um, but just working with other people and, and letting them bring their talents to whatever you're doing in this process, I think has to have a net benefit. Now, I want to ask about your Miles Davis tribute album, A Different Kind of Blue. What was the hardest okay. part about making a solo gu guitar version of that? There wasn't really a hard part. That really came together um, pretty quickly. Um, I think right now, if you got a press release, I think for, for this Ballads and Blues record, I sort of I, I mentioned that they have civil, similar cover art, and I sort of think of them as sisters' albums because this idea of doing a whole bunch of Ballads and Blues was something I wanted to do for a while. And when I was getting ready to do the kind of blue thing, that's originally what I was going to do. And I had sort of the 11th hour decision to do the kind of blue record because three of the tunes were already a part of that. So I just had to add two more. Um, I guess, you know, the hard part was just getting, you know, putting, putting aside the idea, like, you know, you're actually going to try to arrange like all of the parts, like learn all the solos note for note, like maybe a, you know, a, a brilliant classical guitarist or somebody would do, you know, it's just my interpretation of these tunes. I did go through and, and, and listen, you know, to that record and, and another million times. And I had already had up to that point in my life and sort of transcribed things that stood out to me. I never transcribed an entire solo at all. Um, but I would just take all my little favorite riffs and I just had pieces of paper all over my office that had just different things that I wanted to incorporate into what I was doing. Um, I would say secondly, the, the last piece on that record, Flamenco Sketches, which is, it's, uh, it's an 18 or 19 minute solo guitar thing on my album. But I think when we, I think that we have another version of it cause I recorded that whole record twice. Um, you know, I just did it all in one day, but did it all and then came back and did it again. Um, and the second one was something like 25 minutes long. So I think just editing that down and there's a couple of places where I use different tunings and the capos in different places. So putting that together technically, um, so it just plays as one continuous piece of music was tricky. Gotcha. And do you use alter tunings a lot when you're composing or arranging something? No, I'm still working on standard tuning. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, what, what, um, I'll drop the bass string down. That's a thing I do a lot. I do a lot of sort of what we call drop D, but sometimes I'll, like I know on this, um, ballads and blues record, the first track I had dropped the six string down to, um, D flat. Um, I have other tunes where I've gone down to C, um, like all blues on the, um, kind of blue record. So just having like, I, I like a drone, you know, I like a drone bass. So having something happening on the sixth, occasionally on the fifth string too. But if you mess with my first couple strings, I, I, I can't, I, everything goes out the window for me, which I think in, in a sort of more solo guitar, contemporary solo guitar, you know, um, California style or something like that, like, you know, Michael Hedges or something like that. I think that that's great to have multiple strings altered. First of all, it can jar you into a, a different sort of uh, awareness of the instrument, which is kind of neat. Um, 
but you know, I'm more of an improviser. And so every scale I know <laughs> doesn't suddenly doesn't work and that's not good. So now to go back to your arra arranging in general. Is that, do you usually not try to do a note for note of like the solos or anything and try to have your own spin on it? Or was yeah, that that's only for, for Miles Davis where you were like, I'm not going to try to do a note for note transcription. Yeah, right. This is, uh, this is sort of in, be in between. Well, in the sense that when I went into the studio, how much of it was worked out and how much of it was improvised, this is sort of in between. I've never, like, so for some of the standard tunes on here, um, like, let's take Stella by Starlight, uh, the second track. I mean, that's a that's one of my favorite jazz standards. I think it's a very established, you know, melody. Like, obviously, I'm playing the melody at the beginning and the end. Um, I think note for note, I think it's it's all it's all more or less there. But then after that, um, you know, during the sort of I'll say I want to say improvised, but I, I like the word variations better. You know, I'm just kind of taking that and twisting it around and and um, playing a little whisper down the lane with it. Um, that part is, you know, especially live is is very improvised. Um, but sometimes I'll I'll sketch things out. Um, so on this album, I think just about every one of the tunes, like I sketched out some um, solo, some variation section, things like I think like Wichita Lyman, for example, I think I, I really worked out every note in advance. I pretty much try to play it the same way every time. But something like Nostalgia in Times Square or Watermelon Man or maybe a tune like Blues for Freedom, one of my tunes, um, it's never really the same thing twice. Now, when did you, how do you start playing guitar? Like, when did you first get, like, get oh. a passion for the instrument? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, um, I'm 52 now. So um, I started, I think I was seven. Um, so I don't know how many years that is, but I think it's a lot. And uh, one year for uh, Christmas, my grandmother gave uh, my sister and I each uh, guitars from Sears, Sears and Roebuck. And hers was actually sort of like an okay classical guitar, and um, and mine was like a, a toy. And and I thought they were so great, and she didn't care about them. So I quickly took over her classical guitar, and um, and just started teaching myself. Which you know, God only knows what I did, but I think my dad went to the mall and got a book on guitar chords, and somehow we figured out how to tune it. I mean, you know, this is quite a bit before YouTube, and I grew up in a, at that time, a fairly rural part of Pennsylvania with, you know, no guitar teacher. So I was pretty self-taught for a while there. And then I think around age uh, 12, my father took a job in the Silicon Valley, and we, re we uh, relocated. And then being in sort of a more of a metropolitan area, I got a, a guitar teacher. So I studied classical guitar for a little while. Um, and, uh, also I had the same guy saw me twice a week. So the second, the second lesson was like, you know, me wanting to learn Eric Clapton and Jimi Hendrix and things like that. And, uh, and then I had friends that played guitar and stuff and it just kind of went from there. Um, and then throughout all of the eighties, I just, you know, being in the Bay area, Bay area was, uh, was great. Cause that, that sort of California guitar thing was happening like I mentioned earlier like Michael Hedges and William Ackerman and and uh for me personally Alex Degrassi was a real big one like those guys that was all happening right there you know and and a lot of people were playing like that and uh and I was very interested in that and I, I learned some of that or I, I made music kind of like that but mainly it just got that acoustic guitar sound in my head um but I had you know, good teachers and stuff and people that exposed me to different kinds of music. So I've always been really eclectic, you know, sometimes to a fault, but I, at that same time, I was listening to a lot of blues, you know, I was, um, in high school when, you know, everyone was kind of into, um, I don't know what, you know, Ozzy Osbourne or Van Halen, the kind of the heavy metal thing was happening then, but I was really into more Freddie King and, and Albert King and electric blues. And then some of this California guitar stuff, um, and I really loved, you know, classic rock. I think I had kind of boomer envy. I wish I had ten, was 10 years older. And um, I just sort of missed like being able to see like Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. I was a big Jimmy Page fan. And then, you know, just kind of went on from there. <laughs> um, I got interested in jazz around uh, that same age. So in high school, my teacher encouraged me to get some records by like Kenny Burrell um, I'm trying to think, Wes Montgomery, that those first two George Benson records, if you guys are interested in jazz guitar, those are just 
unbelievable. Um, this is before he was doing, you know, this masquerade and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, here I am <laughs> all these years later, and it's just sort of a stew of all of those things. And somewhere along the line, I got really interested in in more traditional music, like um, I guess we'll, uh, you know, we'll call it bluegrass or something or old time music and, and fiddle music. That sort of happened in the last 20 years. And so, you know, there you go. And when did you decide to become a professional? Oh, well, I did my first gig um, in high school. Uh, <laughs> I dated um, a young woman who was a little bit older than I was, and her dad was a, um, um, he played in two bands. He played in um, a country band, and he played in a jazz band, and he had this great old L5, but I digress. Um, and he he's like, uh, you want to do a wedding gig? You know, And he started throwing me wedding gigs like the, they, they couldn't do. So I, I would do like these solo guitar gigs and stuff. And, uh, you know, it was a great job, right? I'm, it's like 1985 or something. I'm, I'm a teenager and I'm making like a couple hundred bucks to go play at somebody's wedding or something. Like, this is great, you know? Um, so it's been, you know, you know, it was pretty on and off from about that age through, I think, age 30. Then I really went more full time because I was, um, I had worked, uh, here's a fun fact. I worked in, um, in some restaurants and did cooking when I lived in San Francisco in the nineties. Um, and so, um, but I quit that, I guess in 1998 or 97, I just started teaching and performing and touring and recording and stuff. Gotcha. And I know, I know, yeah, I noticed you do do a lot of teaching. And one of the things I noticed on your Facebook page, you did like that series of one minute guitar lesson videos. What attracted you to that format? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, yes, I do do a lot of um, teaching, um, especially this year. I've been even more busy and it's kind of nice because there was a couple of years there where I was kind of gone a lot. And it's kind of nice to be at home. So <laughs> I love teaching um, and I just love teaching. But um, right. So someone was encouraging me to get on the Instagram. Right. So um, I hadn't really been on Instagram before that. So once I got on there, I realized that you could post videos. And when I found out they were one minute, I thought, well, that's a great idea. I mean, what can I do in a minute? And so I've done some one minute lessons and some one minute, I've done a couple show and tells with some friends that have like very collectible guitars or whatever. And I've done some little snippets of tunes and stuff and, and I'll do some more. So I got really into that whole idea of what can you do in a minute, you know? Um, so that's what got me into that. And although recently I put up a 95 minute <laughs> lesson just, just because everyone kept saying I, they, they wanted more. So I put that on, on, um, YouTube. It's a breakdown of the tune contemplation from the new record. And what kind of stuff do you think worked well in a one minute format? Cause you can't really explain stuff in too much detail. Yeah. I mean, people, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, you just have to you just have to get down. You know, I've been doing it for so long that I I always like like a piece, something that you can learn that you can use on the gig tonight. You know, like I don't need some long explanation about the origin of the Mixolydian scale. Like show me show me the eight notes and a chord that it works well over and give me a, a compelling demo of it. And good, I'm good to go. You know what I mean? And then, of course, I can always circle back and figure out every possible way of playing it on the guitar if that's what I want to do. But I think, you know, usable bite-sized pieces, pieces of information are, are valuable. And, and that's, you know, I think for creative people, you just want that and then you want to go with it. You know, like I was never the guy when I was younger that would learn an entire solo from note to note. Like I would get to the part where like, oh, there's a cool lick. And then boom, I'd go make my own thing from it. So I'm always looking for that little kernel. So that's that's what I was trying to get at with those one minute things. Just some little kernel that you can take and run with it. That's usually a better way to go, too, because then you don't end up sounding like a guitar robot <laughs> who's just playing what you've yeah, already heard. Right. And, you know, I, I always like to say life is short and everybody else is taken. You know, like I it doesn't it is good to to learn a West Montgomery solo. And I think I would argue it's better to just like listen to one over and over and over again or or analyze it, like like figure out what chords was he playing over and maybe what sort of scale or arpeggio or what variation of the melody is happening and stuff. And so you can understand the thinking behind that and adopt it to what you do. But if you're going to get down to the finest little articulation of every little thing, um, 
it's not going to behoove me in terms of like making my own art. Um, you know, it's different if, if you got, you know, if that's the gig, you know, that you're being hired to, to learn a Steely Dan solo note for note, then, then that's a, that's a different thing. Right. But in terms of developing your own style and your own, you know, work, um, I think you should understand what people do and find what concepts really resonate with you and just take them and, and fold them into what you do and not get preoccupied with, um, you know, transcribing some entire thing from, from beginning to end. And that's one of the things about that kind of different kind of blue album that I really liked was how you didn't do the note for note because it made it sound more like a tribute album instead of like an imitation album. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm not capable of that anyway. So it works out nicely. You know, like I, I couldn't sit there for two. That would take me five years. Right. To write, figure out how to play uh, all three horn parts harmonized throughout. I mean, it's just and at that point, it's just sort of a trick. Right. It's like you're trying to I mean, and it's an amazing trick. And I love when people can do that. I've seen, you know, we I think we all get the YouTubes of somebody who's figured out like this elaborate pop tune and they can do the whole thing on the guitar. No for no. I mean, that it, it's amazing. Um, but that's not me. Yeah. And a lot of those Bill Evans voicings are so crazy. You can't really even play physically play them on a six string. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a good example, by the way, of what I'm what I'm saying. Like, like if you just understand where he was coming from, right? Having these these voicings where you have notes that are really close together in the middle of them, and if you isolate just those two notes, it's actually you know it sounds like the devil's interval or something, right? But you surround it by a couple other notes, and it sounds really great. So in other words, you might have a four note chord, and two of them are really fighting with each other, but it's a really beautiful thing. And if you just understand that, and then Go do your own thing with it, right? Like, how can you take, ask yourself today, this could be your project, right? Just take this this idea of having these very closely, close, uh, closely voiced chords and adapt it to what you do. You don't actually have to figure out exactly which chords Bill is doing. You just have to take that idea and run with it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Gotcha. No. Yeah. Back to your lessons. I'm wondering, what's the main, what's the first thing you try to teach a guitar student? Like, let's say someone who's like at an intermediate level already knows like the basics of the instrument. You know, more and more um, with teaching, I think because of the availability of the Internet. I mean, if you want to learn, um, you know, one of these solos, like I was just saying, if you wanted to learn like a Steely Dan guitar solo from 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 uh, note to note, note. Yeah, uh, note for note, um, you know, you could go on YouTube and someone is going to spoon feed it to you. You know, I mean, like the, that's not of what guitar teaching is anymore. I think it used to be. It was sort of like you had a superpower. People would come over and you could you could transcribe a record onto paper. And, you know, but that's not really a part of it anymore. Mo mostly it's like learning how to practice and learning how to perform and learning how to make music. So, um you know, in addition to actually showing people notes and talking about concepts, if people have seen my 30 day guitar challenge on YouTube, where I tried very deliberately to have 30 kind of slightly longer video lessons than the one minute ones where I'm um, trying to show people stuff with, but I deliberately didn't have any tablets or any scales or any notes at all. So the skills that I try to get across to people first and foremost from the very beginning it's really how to listen, right? Because you can't have good tone if you're not really listening. It's not just you go to the store and you buy the really great guitar and the really nice strings and, and now you have good tone. No, you have to listen, right? You can't have good time if you can't really listen. You can't play with others if you can't really listen. So, um, you know, some in-depth discussions about um, listening as opposed to just hearing, you know, but really being able to take things apart with your ears. Um, is really important. Um, and then, you know, after that, kind of going down that same list, like having good time and having good tone, you know, if you can only play two or three chords, but people can clap their hands to it, you're going to make friends. You know, if you know 75 chords and people can't lock into what you're doing in some basic way, then it's, you know, they can't connect with what you're doing. So these are like some really fundamental things that get across. And it's always really potent stuff, right? If we're learning some really easy piece, but they play it with nice tone and in time, it's, it's elevated. It comes to life, right? Yeah. 
um, it doesn't sound like someone trying to play the guitar. It sounds like someone making music. So, um, and the same thing with improvisation. When I have like a, a beginner, I, I try to uh, impart upon them that you are just as entitled to, to, to launch into you know, a solo as in someone who's been playing for 40 years now. It doesn't, I love when you get like a, a 10 year old, I don't really work with kids that much, but if you get a 10 year old and you show them the pentatonic and they just play the crap out of it, you know, and then you show someone who's like, um, 30, you know, the same scale. And I go, I don't know what to do with it. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, show me, show me, show me something I'm like, just do it, you know? Um, so there's a lot, I'm really interested in trying to impart a lot about the mental process and, and how to practice and, and, and how to perform. Um, and that goes hand in hand with just learning, you know, where to put your fingers and, and what notes go together and whatnot. I mean, it sounds like a lot of that stuff, especially listening, it's more down to attitude than real playing technique. Yeah. Another thing, um, uh, you know, I do a lot of Skype lessons, which is great. Um, but I love teaching, you know, I live in a city, so it's great. I got a lot of in-person students, students, and there's just, I think for a lot of people, especially today, um, you know, we're a little bit more connected online, but disconnected sort of in flesh and blood, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, for a lot of players just coming in here, they just, we just, the 45 minute lessons is like 45 minutes of us playing together, you know, and especially if you have someone who's like an upper intermediate jazz student or bluegrass student, you know, to sit and play, uh, you know, 40 minutes straight of autumn leaves or something. It's, it's pretty great. You know, um, I have some, I'm very fortunate. I have some friends or guitar players that I just, I really, really love and admire. And, um, Adam, Adam Levy was here last weekend. We did a little house concert here in Portland and, and we were talking about this and, and how, like, if you're playing with someone that you really kind of look up to and they just have you know, just some scale or something, or it could be something that, you know, like, here's how I play a C chord. And it's just because you're having that in-person experience, something chemical happens and you're just sort of like, wow, I never thought about it. This is really great. I'm really excited. You know, I could have read three books about this, but it wouldn't have been that interesting or watched some guy on YouTube and whatever, but actually having an experience in real life, I think is a real premium. So, um, that seems to be more and more a big part I mean, that's the feedback I'm getting from students that they really uh, like coming and actually playing with somebody. Um, and that's an important part of um, of your development. You know, it, it's what it's the log on the fire. You know, it's what keeps this thing burning. I think when I play with somebody, I get um, inspired and, and want to just keep moving the ball down the field. All right. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was great to have you. Uh, where can our listeners find out more information about your Skype lessons and your music? Sure. Um, I have a website and it's just ericsky.com. So just E-R-I-C-S-K-Y-E. -E, and there's all kinds of information there about what I do and links to recordings. And, uh, and you know, you can Google me. Um, I have a, um, you know, YouTube page and a Facebook page and stuff like that. So you can see some of my, my video content there. And what about for Skype lessons? If you go to my website, um, there's a there's a under the menu there. There's I think it, it says instruction, um, and if you click there, it talks about if you're if you happen to be traveling through the Pacific Northwest and you want to come by and spend some time with me one afternoon, um, we can do that. Or if you actually live here, and then there's um, an option where you can email me about Skype lessons. All right, great. Well. Thank you so much, Eric, for coming on the show. One last question. Are you doing any tours or anything to promote blues and ballads? Um, I'm not. I'm starting to. You know, I it won't go down the rabbit hole, but I had a little bit of a right hand injury over the last uh, six or seven months. And so I really didn't know how that was going to play out. The, the short end of that is it, that it's getting a lot better. But I deliberately kind of didn't book anything because I didn't know how things were going to go. So um, probably, um, you know, the end of the winter, uh, going into the spring, look for me out there. <laughs> All right, great. Glad to hear your hands doing better. Again, this was acoustic guitarist Eric Sky. His latest album, Blues and Ballads, is available on all major online retailers and streaming sites. Stay tuned for more music.